So this session is discs and cylinders. Um, I understand that there's a, a need to give a title to these sessions, but that, that's really about as close as you can get to a miscellaneous uh, section. Uh, you, I mean, this could potentially have been called you know, the, the sound recording session, and I don't know that it would narrow it down a whole lot more than that. Uh, but, but we'll see along the way what uh, really makes this uh, distinctively about discs as discs and cylinders as cylinders. I believe there will be some connections to be made along the way that will make the session rise above a miscellaneous section. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce this first group of speakers, a group of people I've had the pleasure of working with together on a number of projects, although this is one I've just been observing from a distance. Uh, David Giovannoni, who's uh, known to many or all of you, a uh, man who's had a hand in all kinds of interesting projects connected with early recorded sound. The, the person I dare say is, is singly most responsible for the fact we can listen to phonautograms today, and who is uh, right here. Along with him, we'll have uh, Rich Martin and Megan Hennessy of Archeophone Records. Uh, you heard uh, Rich speaking in the plenary session that started off the conference earlier, so you have some familiarity with Archeophone if you didn't before. But in any case, the project that they have to share with us today is, I, I think, a, a very interesting one on a number of levels. Uh, there have been a number of efforts to attack early recorded sound in, en masse in large quantities, uh, you know, attempting to come close to covering entire catalogs of material uh, as you know, competent, good, you know, reasonable transfers, and so on. And then on the other hand, you have meticulously restored tracks that appear on, on compilation CDs of various sorts, but, but uh, somewhat selective, not, not a great deal of material that uh, really compared to what was available at any time. Uh, what really makes this uh, project exciting is it really combines those two things in, in a very innovative and exciting way. And I'm particularly interested in what they'll have to say about how they're making that work. So, David Giovannoni, Richard Martin, Megan Hennessy, the Blue Amberall at 100. You know, all my fans are here today, all of our fans. Are, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Blue Amberall is a little over 100, um, but we didn't really get our act together uh, last year. Um, you all know what a Blue Amberall looks like. They're things you throw at the wall or stomp on when you get mad. Um, the, uh, the Blue Amberall was uh, released in 13? 12. 12, end of 12 and uh, was the last cylinder standing in 1929 when Edison uh, shut down all of the record interests. Um, it's probably the most ubiquitous cylinder out there, and um, you can pick them up for cheap. In fact, this is how this project started, if I could tell the story. Um, as a collector, I'm out buying record collections, and uh, a few years ago, I found myself, after having bought four or five significant collections with uh, 20,000 cylinders um, in storage as yet unprocessed, and then when I started processing them, I found that 8,000 of them were these damn blue amberols, and I didn't know exactly what to do with them. Um, I started to assemble them and process them, and I found that two of the five collections, two of the five collectors uh, whose collections I had bought after their passing, um, had actually started to put together runs of cylinders. And not just runs, but um, best copies. And um, as I put these collections together, I found, you know, there's still lots of holes, but within the first thousand or so in the series, which are all Blue Amberals worth having, and we'll talk about that in a minute, that there were over 90% of the titles were, were uh, represented in the collections that I had bought because I really wanted the other cylinders in the collection. Um, I talked to Megan and to Rich about this, and they said, well, let's put them out. Let's see if we can do a complete run. Uh, really, nobody's done that yet. There are several public institutions that uh, are kind of working towards that end. 
So it was a bit uh, audacious of us to uh, even try. Uh, but we started uh, putting them out 30 a month as downloads, and uh, they're still available to you. Let me talk about, so that's the impetus of the project. Let me talk to you about the project itself now. We're going to talk about three things today. First, there are some blue amberols that are worth preserving. And it is not heretical at all to say most are not worth preserving. <laughs> and I'll explain that to, to you. You will agree with me at the end. Um, second, if it's worth preserving, it's worth restoring. It's worth bringing out the sound that is in the grooves of blue amberols. Uh, most blue amberols you've heard today uh, have not been restored. Third, we believe our work, which is privately supported, commercial model, uh, is worth supporting. And we're going to talk to you about that because it's a model that we think um, complements what the, what the National Recording Preservation Plan assumes, and that is that most preservation will be publicly f or funded or grant funded. We think that there's this other model that, it, as we showed during our initial session with Chris and Rich and others in, uh, at the session, that the commercial reissuers are doing every bit as much and have done much more over the years as publicly funded uh, internet sites and so forth. So those are our three key points today. Let's walk through those. First, worth, worth preserving. Now, I do, it does sound heretical to say that most blue amberols are not worth preserving, but let me explain that to you. We're focused here on the domestic series. Edison's uh, recordings, blue amberol recordings for the domestic U.S. market. He had other series as well. We're going to leave those aside for today. <laughs> we all do. <laughs> we all want those. Uh, but these are the common blue amberols. Um, for the first couple years of production, from late 1912 to 1914, Edison produced almost all what we call live or direct recordings. These were recordings that, record, that were made directly into the horn, into a stylus that cut a cylinder, live to cylinder. Um, around 1914, uh, Edison had invented the diamond disc. And to save money, Edison said, well, we've got the performance on the diamond disc. Let's just dub it to cylinder. OK. Now, if a diamond disc exists, today, a commercially reissued diamond disc issue, exists today, that's going to be at least one generation, probably two up, from the best sounding blue amberol. Okay. Now, most blue amberols in your collections at institutions are of this type. The question is, are they worth preserving? If you have the disc, which most people do, most discs are not that rare, then you have to answer that question yourselves. I would say, no, absolutely not. The disc will sound better. Uh, it's a higher, you know, higher up on the uh, generational chain. The, these 67% of Blue Amberall titles in the domestic series are dubbed from commercially available discs. And, um, Blue Amberol started at 1500, 1501 was the first uh, issue number, catalog number. And they go up, what's the highest, Kurt, 57, 19? 5718. 5718. Okay. There was a, a small series in there, 75, that for, were, were for school series, which are exquisitely rare today. Um, but for the most part, every number in between there had, was, was an issued uh, uh, was an issued uh, title. So of those numbers, 57, 47, about 4,200 titles, 67%, two, two out of three of those titles, you can find better copies on the diamond discs. So we're focusing on this section here. There are three types of blue amberols that are worth preserving, in our opinion. <clears throat> the first type 
Edison uh, reissued from four-minute wax amberol. This was his uh, format be beforehand. Uh, he was prohibited legally by uh, pressing in celluloid between 1908 and 1912. And so he pressed in a very brittle wax, metallic wax soap, uh, which wore very quickly. Uh, but to get content into this new uh, format in uh, late 12 through 13 and into 14, he was bringing a lot of that old material forward, pressing it in blue amberols and reissuing it. Uh, about 9% of the titles uh, fit, this, uh, fit this description. Then he was recording directly to Cylinder for the first time and releasing for the first time on Blue Amberol. About 16% of the titles in this series uh, fall into that category. Those are probably the best sounding Blue Amberols and if so, the best, some of the best sounding cylinder recordings ever made. Now there's another 8% of Blue Amberols that were dubbed. So you say, well, why do we even cons concern ourselves about those? Well, they're dubbed from unreleased discs. And um, those discs may or may not exist today, uh, but we've included them, we've embraced them in uh, Blue Ambrose worth preserving because they may in fact be the only record of that performance uh, extant. So when you add those three together, you're looking at about one in three titles that are uh, worth preserving, uh, and the rest, not so much. Okay? So it's not too heretical to say that some things are more important than others, deserve a much higher priority than others, and uh, are actually, active, uh, actually worth actively seeking. Um, Rich, you want to talk about uh, the second set and uh, a blue amber that's worth um, worth preserving, we think is also worth restoring. We'll take questions here and at the end. We'll be short. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say a few words about your work in the preservation realm. Okay, you can do that. <clears throat> so, uh, as Dave alluded uh, to, he has uh, a vast collection of these and um, he's selecting the best copy from among many copies of a given title that he may have. We're not simply taking the first copy, we're taking the best copy. And uh, he is uh, using uh, an archaeophone uh, universal cylinder uh, player to make the transfers. Each transfer is uh, carefully, um, uh, carefully done squaring the, the mandrel and or the squaring the cylinder on the mandrel and getting it, it uh, lined up just right. And he's doing them at uh, archival uh, specifications, 24-bit, 96 kilohertz in stereo. <clears throat> so we have um, these archival uh, uh, transfers and, uh, and, they're, and they're, they, they stay that way. We, we don't do any destructive editing on top of that. So then they come to me and uh, from there, I'm doing, I'm doing the next step. I'm doing the restoration. So uh, get a little AB here. And um, here's the very first selection uh, in the series. It's uh, 1501, and it's, uh, it's an orchestral piece. And I go forward more. Uh, you need to explain this is from a... OK, so the first thing I'm going to show you is a, is a raw uh, transfer. Uh, this is not one of our own. Um, this is uh, something that you could get online at one of the many places um, that quite thankfully have, have been trying to do some of this work, have been making it freely available, which we greatly appreciate their efforts. But uh, you're going to notice there are some problems here, and, um, and this is the sort of thing that, that people have faced up till now. You want to listen to the quality of the of the signal here. Lots of loud flutter. Seth is 
dying. <laughs> on, on a boat? <laughs> okay, well, if it's worth preserving, it's also worth restoring. Okay, so uh, we believe that uh, when transferring, the, the best practice is to make a flat stereo transfer. But we don't believe that a flat uh, restoration is the best practice. So we're, we're working really hard to pull out the, uh, you know, the infelicities in the low end and then the high end, but uh, then we're EQing to bring out uh, that bass. There's a very rich bass on these blue amberols, uh, you just have to you have to locate it, and then there's a uh, any of anybody who's ever worked on them, they always have that thump, uh, the the plaster of Paris just it, it it's going to happen, and those have to be pulled out um, quite judiciously. Well, here's another example. We'll get you a little bit a uh, little bit more excited here, hopefully. But here's a another example of a, a raw transfer on another site. Uh, that you could get for free. Lots of distortion. That's worn, worn considerably. It's certainly worth listening to. <laughs> but if it's worth preserving, it's also worth restoring. Seth, if you got any problems you need fixed, just send them my way. Um, <laughs> Same surface noise level too. What's that? Same surface. By the way, if you notice something after it's restored, you can now bring the whole digital level up to something that's listable. Right? That's right. You can't record it at that level because you're going to be clipping off all the trans. That's right. That's right. Um, well, the last point uh, that we wanted to make was that. Uh, uh, this is work we believe is worth supporting. Am I doing this one, or do you want to do it? <laughs> we'll, we'll tag on it. Um, we have uh, launched this uh, download project that David mentioned, um, trying to uh, get into that age, reach different uh, kinds of consumers. Um, we've been putting out 30 of these a month, uh, a double album, uh, basically on uh, iTunes and Google Play and uh, Amazon, and you can still get those. We'll have 12 volumes available. But uh, if you want to wait, you can, uh, at the end of the year, uh, we hope to have ready volume one of the physical series, which will uh, be about 500 tracks on about 30 CDs in a, in a little box. You know, going to keep it very kind of archival, um, a little bit lighter on, on the literature which we have been making available freely on our website uh, to go along with the download series. Um, 
one of the things we have found from our customer base is that they are still very much dedicated to physical product. We're trying to answer that need as well as the, uh, the need of, of those who, who want downloadable product. Um, we think this is something that's going to be very attractive to uh, archives and libraries. One thing that uh, we hope we uh, have it, are achieving in this series is that we've done it for you. If you've got a, a big collection of these, um, we hope that you will not find it necessary to do your own transfers because we're doing them for you. And we believe that the sound that we're uh, accomplishing is is going to be better than than you will have that you'll have time for. Let's put it that way. Um, so it's ready to go. So the blue amber all at 100, worth preserving, worth restoring, and worth supporting. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions, Jay? Yeah. So the question was pretty straightforward. Outside of the unreleased on disk, do these fall into a numerical range? Yes. How many are you looking for and are you advertising? We spent we spent an hour and forty minutes this morning looking for a chart that I prepared uh, that shows you what you lays out the numerical range and and we it just wasn't on our servers where we thought it was. Uh, so they do fall in range. They do Everything from 1501 to 2500, the first thousand, there's only one in there that's from a dubbed released disc. How about the foreign ones? How about them? You know I want them. Where well, are they? Well, here's the thing, Chris. <laughs> Support us on this, and then we'll do the hard stuff. OK, this is the easy stuff. Well, do you know they exist? Yes, we do. They well, exist all over the place. Really? Yeah, there's, name the series for me. There's Mexican I want the series, Spanish series. The Spanish series, Mexican series, there's a Cuban series, there's yeah. uh, what else, Bill? Puerto Rican. No, I don't want Puerto none Rican? of the rest, just the Puerto Cuban and Mexican. Yeah. Okay, well, Chris, we're going to work on that for you then. Tim? You mentioned uh, correctly that uh, the dubs uh, are a generation or two beyond the discs. However, the uh, issued discs of the Teens, the black label, are, are notorious for their uh, poor sound quality. Uh, even Edison joked about them in that famous uh, yeah. dealer thing. So can you get better sound, do you think, out of one of those poorly pressed discs than you can out of a cylinder? Yes, you can get better sound out of a pristine cylinder dub <clears throat> than you can out of a typically crummy World War I era uh, disc. But um, our belief is that there are good pressings out there still of those discs, either later or a disc that didn't, early pressings, discs that didn't suffer the uh, physical mechanical deterioration uh, that they have. And Jerry's got a whole bunch of master uh, stampers uh, at the site, excuse me, the, the park. The Thomas Edison National Historical Park um, that he's working on getting transferred as well. So um, your point is very well taken, and I think we've been guilty of using cylinder transfers of uh, some discs in, in their work, but before that very reason. But um, somewhere, 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 someplace, these things probably exist in better form. Rob, well, you, you've been very explicit about what you mean by worth preserving mm -hmm. and worth restoring, but not so explicit about the form of support that you may be seeking. Um, to be honest, the Archiphone Archives, which is the label or, or sub-label, oh, imprint. imprint, excuse me, I'm not up on the lingo. Archiphone Archives is the imprint under which we've been releasing these. Um, as digital downloads only. The, this is the first Archeophone product that does not have physical product. Um, it's not been a gang-busting success. So, 
Uh, and, Rich, and Rich said, why? His, his clients want his physical, physical product. product. So. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, some of the archives are, are coming up to us saying, uh, we want these. Um, uh, we're buying them uh, for the time being, but please tell us you're going to put them on physical media uh, so we can get uh, something a little more permanent and also get the full wave quality. Oh, okay, I, I did understand that. I thought you were looking for support in kind of an underwriting no, we we just look. We're you gonna just, we're gonna put out a if brick. You have an offer. Yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> we're gonna put out a brick, 30 CDs. I don't know. We haven't priced it yet, but you know what do 30 CDs cost in a brick? It's not a lot of money for the amount of music that you're getting. Buy it for crying out loud. Don't steal it. Put it in your libraries. Put it in your archives. Make it available to people you serve, or put it in your own collection. Because if we can't sell out the first couple thousand units of that, there won't be volume two. That's what I'm, let me be very clear and crass. Buy the stuff. I, perhaps, Support us. Thank perhaps you. my problem is I think too much like a public radio person. There you go. <laughs> perhaps that's mine too. Among the unreleased cylinders, typically the Edison uh, discs release multiple takes of, of uh, pork multiple performances or multiple takes um, are there instances where the cylinders contain material that are otherwise unreleased on published recordings on published recordings we haven't found it yet and in, in fact um, I'll, I'll let you in on a secret the dots that we used to believe indicate a take don't indicate take um, and we haven't written this up yet but it's more, com it's more complicated than that. I have been comparing takes, A, B, playing one live while listening to a recorded one, I mean, absolutely simultaneously. And there's only one instance in the first 500 in the series, only one instance where there is a significant difference in the performance. And that's when Joe Hines, uh, when Golden, uh, Golden Hughes, when Hughes uh, in one, says that he's from Truckamuck, and the other he's from... It was the state. It was Georgia versus... Georgia no, versus North, North Carolina, Carolina or something North like North that. Carolina. But it was the same routine. It was, I mean, almost verbatim, word for word, delivered exactly the same, and yet in one he's from Truckamuck and the other he's from Georgia. So there are, we have found ver Edison's, Edison's folks demanded consistency from take to take is what we suspect. Now, when you get into the 20s and the jazz stuff, that's a whole different deal, but that's not where we are yet. George. I strongly endorse this idea that if you're doing it, then nobody else has to do it. And you're doing it well enough so that there's not a question of whether somebody should do it. But one thing I do have a concern about is whether, because it's worth restoring, there's such a high subjectivity level mm -hmm. with that. And although the examples you played sound wonderful, uh, are you going to make the unrestored flat or, uh, or unprocessed transfers available? We haven't well, talked about that. We we maintain them. Uh, we have we have servers that are the equal of most institutions actually. Um, but you know when I make a transfer. It goes off-site that night. Uh, it sits on uh, in the TDR. Uh, it goes up to their house the following day. So we have multiple off-site locations. We're running raid arrays. I mean, we. It's going to be. It's it's it's. It's, we're, we're, it's going we're, to be there. It's going to be there. Now the question is, we haven't. It's really their decision from a business perspective whether to let the archival transfers out, the 2496 flat stereos out. Um, and if so, when to do that? Um, I, do. I don't know that I would do it before this product has uh, broken even. Um, and uh, then the other question is, who are we going to give it to or sell it to? And what are they going to do with it? Because I, I agree. I agree 100 percent. It's the archive series. The transfers are going to be very hard to beat for a very long time. Seth. 
software are using to restore these? I'll address that right now. Um, Dave is using uh, Capstan uh, to uh, to 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 get the to, well to get the stability. That's right. Uh, it's tough with the vocals. Capstan is not really meant to do that. Um, so we're cheating here and there to to get the results. Because of the instability of the voice itself. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, I'm using a variety of tools. Um, uh, I use uh, Waves and uh, Isotope RX and SoundForge and some other stuff. The things that have been most useful for this type of media have been the Waves Decrackler and the Isotope RX variety of uh, functions. The, de the declicker they've got is terrific. Uh, the uh, Spectral Repair is very much like your uh, Retouch, which I use quite a bit. Um, and the, um, they've got a Deconstruct function, which is unbelievable. Um, the bottom end, like I said earlier, has got, you know, the, the thump over and over and over and over again. And that, uh, you know, I have to take that bottom and, and really kind of clean it out. Um, I don't eliminate it, so it still has texture and depth there. But uh, SoundForge is one of them. Gary. Is, is the pitch instability an inherent problem in his recording process, or is it a result of physical deformity over time? It's the latter. Um, we've not found any blue amber all perfectly, that is still perfectly true, that we can play back perfectly true on the Archiphone Mandrel, you know, after you make all the correct adjustments, which, by the way, a, a number of these, you know, um, online sources didn't really seem to pay a lot of attention to. Um, because they're all, but we've never found one perfectly in, in, in like mint condition, perfectly transferred, where there's any speed instabilities, wow or flutter, burned in. Not to say it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. We hear it on early discs all the time. We know what to listen for. We just the blue amber all seem to be very ha, seem to have been recorded on a very reliable true lathe. Um, the mechanical problems come from the swelling of the plaster of Paris, the cracking of the plaster of Paris, uh, the def def it deforms the uh, uh, celluloid, um, all sorts of things, bad things happen to these things. Uh, a lot of it can be corrected on the mandrel of the archaeophone because of the adjustments, and we, I spend, most of my time is spent adjusting, not transferring. Yes. Uh, blue amber all that might play like this, you know, as it turns. Well, if you can make the mandrel do that, then the blue amber all is nice and true. Also adjusting the back end of the two, the height yeah, there's all sorts of adjustments you can make. Can I ask you one other thing? Have you hit anywhere there were uh, skip grooves or repeated grooves? All the, so all the time. When we, when we have a less than nice copy, yes, that happens. How do you get around it? Play it backwards. Okay. I found another way of doing it. Oh, that's another way, sure. Sure. Sure, there's, there's all sorts of tricks. I can show you a trick I do with a, with a pencil. Uh, there's all sorts of things. Uh, you know, um, everybody's, got a, everybody's got a trick. We're, get, we're getting uh, pulled off, hook, hooked off the stage here, so. Uh, uh, we do one, one more. Okay, Brad. I'm wondering if you have any familiarity with the uh, cylinder playback system that the Phonogram Archive is using in Vienna, and whether that might work any better for this uh, for these issues. No. Oh. You, might, you might need to test the notches and see if that would be something alternative. Is that the one with the big acoustical horn? No. Okay. Uh, Bill says it's probably no better, and if Bill says that, I believe it. Okay, okay. He knows. He knows. Others? Good. Thank you. Thank you.